Um, I think that, you know, so it's probably fair to say that, uh, you know, the eater and eating patterns of, of modern indigenous tribes are not necessarily reflective of what, what we would have had access to. And, and, and I know you alluded to this, but I mean, there's pretty good archaeological evidence that, you know, maybe homo sapien brain capacity maybe peaked 100,000 years ago, 125,000 years ago. And then as that megafaunal die off, and there, there's some evidence that maybe people think that the fire stick burning uh, of, of agriculture, all, you know, excel, you know, there's a lot of things like you talk about, but there's a lot of it was human intervention or human activities that led to these, these animal dive. And I know there's some people that think it's some asteroid that collided and caused a North American megafaunal die off. And I think that's, but it doesn't show up in the rest of the world. And so even if you were to accept that, 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 that hypothesis, but we see that, uh, you know, at least my understanding is we see a significant decrease in robustness in a number of different ways in the human skeleton and human fossil records once we sort of went to this, we, we went away from this hunting or hunting gathering lifestyle into a more of, a, uh, of an agricultural based uh, lifestyle. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, I'll, and I'll start with a, a lesson that I learned. One of my first classes in graduate school was a human osteology class, so human bone class, and I knew nothing about it, right? I, so I walk into this class, had no information on human bones. That In fact, I was so naive that the very first class they asked about how do you tell the difference between humans and females by looking, or males and females by looking at the skeletons, and I actually, and I'll admit to this, I actually raised my hand and said the number of ribs, but anyhow, um, I got laughed out of the room. But um, about a week later, in that first in that class, we uh, the professor well, we had learned nothing about bones yet, and he and he has in the middle of the room two skeletons, and they both came from um, the same site in Pennsylvania. They were both Native American, but they were different ages by several thousand years. And one of the skeletons was uh, a hunter gatherer, pre agriculture Native American, and the other was an early agriculture, you know, when, when agriculture first comes in into the area. So still prehistoric, still pre-European colonization, but, you know, a, a, a Native American that was farming. And he said, can you tell me which one's which? And remember, I had no training in this whatsoever. And they were night and day. I mean, night and day. The hunter-gatherers, and some people would suggest this is kind of, sort of anecdotal, but it's not. I mean, it was right in front of me. This is, you know, this robust skeleton with a mouth, and, and they were similar age, by the way. They were both males, and they were very similar. Um, they were like in their mid to late 30s. Um, the the uh, hunter-gatherer, robust, had all of its teeth. There was no signs of disease in the bones. And then the early, you know, the, the agricultural skeleton had, the teeth were liter literally falling out of their skull. They were worn down to the nerve, and you, you could just see. I didn't know what diseases they were in the bones, but you could just see that the bones were riddled with disease. And that impression will never, will never leave me. So yeah, huge difference. When, when we, you know, farming, as, as many people know, is, creates one of the most fragile resource bases in the world. So even if the food was good, even if what you were pulling out of those fields was something that humans should be eating, it's still a fragile resource base and fails all the time, right? So, you know, what, what you see and what we see in the bones quite often archaeologically, when we, when, when we see agriculture come into areas, especially when they're still trying to figure it out, we see several things in the bones. One is disease. One is um, uh, bones that are a lot less robust, bodies that are less tall. Um, we see ages decline rapidly in, in populations, but we also see Harris lines in the bones and um, uh, um, uh, 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 enamel hypoplasia on the teeth. So in both of those cases, when the bones are the growth plates of the bones and, and the areas when the, when the teeth are adult teeth are still in the mouth before they erupt, but you're still laying on layers of enamel. If there is a interruption in growth because of either um, uh, disease or uh, nutrition, it, it interrupts it and it leaves a scar in the bones and the teeth. And we see this in these populations over and over and over again. So at, at every point, yes, we see it in the archaeological record. Hey, Bill, let me just, uh, this is another uh, thing that often comes up and I think it's a misconception, but uh, let's talk about lifespan because most people say, well, you know, prehistoric man, they only lived to 25, 30, and they sort of forget to, to include the infant mortality data on the population averages there. So do we have evidence perhaps that maybe they weren't all dying at 25 years of age? Oh, certainly they weren't dying at 25 years of age. And, it, and it's something I've heard you and a lot of others speak about, and it's in the anthropological literature as well. As, as everyone, or hope everyone knows, surviving, 
humans, when, when we stand upright, we five, six, seven million years ago, we gave up a lot. Like becoming human was a very difficult thing to do with a whole bunch of different trade-offs. And one of the things, one of the, the, the bad things, you know, negative things about being human, which doesn't affect any of the three of us, well, at least directly, is we have the most painful and dangerous childbirth of any animal on the planet. And one of the things that we had to do in order to, you know, and, and we're, we're literally through evolutionary forces, we are right at that sweet spot to produce a baby with the largest head possible while still allowing the mother to survive childbirth, right? Or they're both to survive childbirth. So what we've done, what evolution has done is allowed a lot of the growing of the human brain and body in, in, to happen outside of the body, right? Because if we allowed for the maturity of, of a human fetus to happen inside the mother the way it does in other animals, they would, we, 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 a mother wouldn't be able to push the baby out, right? Just too big. So if you look at a horse, if you ever saw, um, the first time I ever saw a horse born, I was amazed. A horse comes out, we stand there and... The farmer said, you know what? If that horse doesn't stand up in, in 45 minutes, we're calling the vet. What do you mean it's going to stand up in 45 minutes? And the thing stood up in like 25 minutes. <laughs> oh, my God. You know, a human baby, we wait, what, eight, nine, whatever months for it. So that what we've done is we've created babies. In order to become human, in order to create bodies and brains this big, the trade-off was we're pushing out babies that are still growing outside of the body the way they normally would have been growing inside of the body. So we have a period of time that's very, we, we give birth to useless baby humans. That's what we do. They can't defend themselves. So through culture and through, you know, behavioral changes, we, we protect that baby to get to the point where it can fend for itself. But, you know, we're talking years compared to days or months that other animals would, would do. So it's very dangerous for a human baby in this world, especially the world in the past. A lot of infant mortality. And, you know, it isn't. In, so if you, if you take that an average lifespan for a human, if we say, what is an average lifespan? Maybe it is in the past 25, 30, whatever years. But that it's skewed. Right? That, that it's, it's a meaningless calculation. If we say, if you survive to a certain age, if you survive childhood to you, where you can fend for yourself, then what is the average lifespan? We're talking, you know, a really nice lifespan, high 60s, 70s, you know, and we certainly have even outliers that are close to what we have today. So right there, that calculation is important. And one quick aside, which I think is really interesting. When we think about the, the, if we have conversations about a human biological evolution, you can't just have that conversation without talking about diet, without talking about environment, without talking about technology, but also without talking about culture. And here's a, here's a great example, and this speaks directly to the babies um, and how, you, how defenseless they are. Humans are one of the, human females are one of the only, you know, spe females of our species are the only species, we're the only species that have females that live past menopause. I mean, think about it, why? I mean, there must have been evolutionary forces that produced this. And the thinking is the role of the grandmother, the role of the grandmother in, in, in freeing up a mother to help with the other things that, that are, that are um, you know, societies in the past needed, uh, but still caring for that child. You know, groups that did that had more babies, had more successful babies. And those are the ones that, you know, their genes went into the gene pool and it increased and increased. And it was, it's very interesting to, to consider this.